everyone, and welcome to the 10th episode of the School of Resistance, a live stream format that invites experts on change around the world to discuss valuable alternatives for the future and to create a blueprint for politics of resistance. Today's episode is called Speaking the Truth is Not a Crime. And in this 10th episode of School of Resistance, the Turkish author and ex-journalist Ece Temel Kuran will discuss together with the former drone program technician and whistleblower Sean Westmoreland and international human rights lawyer Renata Avila the right of free speech and its responsibility in an age of disinformation. My name is Kasia Wojcik. And I am more than happy, frankly, I am quite honored to introduce our guests to you today. I will start with Ece. Uh, Ece Temelkuran is one of Turkey's best known um, novelists and political commentators. And her journalism has appeared in The Guardian, New York Times, New Statesman, Der Spiegel, etc. She won Penn Translate Award with Women Who Blow on Knots, 2013, and with her political long essay, Turkey, the Insane and Melancholy, 2016, she received New Ambassador of Europe Prize from Poland. Her latest book, How to Lose a Country, The Seven Steps from Democracy to Dictatorship, was inter internationally acknowledged. Her new book, Together, is coming out in May 2021. Let me introduce to you another guest. Um, in 2009, Sean Westmoreland was one of the US Air Force communications personnel who built a critical component of the global communications infrastructure underlying the drone program in Afghanistan through the 73rd Expeditionary Air Control Squadron. Its area of responsibility covered 620,000 square kilometers over Afghanistan and assisted in networking drones and other disparate ground and air assets across coalition forces and service branches. It, helps connect the, it helped connect the battlefield in Afghanistan to the Combined Air Operations Center in al Udaid, Qatar, and DSGS-5 at Ramstein, Germany. At the end of his tour, he received a document stating that he assisted in 200 plus enemy kills while the United Nations assistance mission in Afghanistan reported over 300 civilians killed that year due to airstrikes. Sean began speaking openly about his role in November of 2015, alongside three other former servicemen. He is an outspoken advocate for the removal of weapons from drones and against overclassification. Since 2018, he has been working at the Mexican-American border helping refugees seeking asylum. And let me introduce you to our last guest, Renata Avila. Renata Avila is a lawyer, author, and advocate. She brings more than 15 years of experience in technology and human rights. She's a two, 2020 Stanford Race and Technology Fellow at the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity in partnership with the Stanford Institute of Human-Centered Artificial, Artificial Intelligence. She is a co-founder of the A+, Alliance for Inclusive Algorithms, which aims to bring more equality and social justice to di digitization and automation and future labor policies. Expert in digital rights, she studies the politics of data, the evolution of transparency, and their implications on trade, democracy, and society, alerting about a phenomenon she describes as digital colonialism. She advocates for the right to publish and defend whistleblow and defense whistleblowers and journalists speaking truth to power. She is also a board member for Creative Commons. She also serves as a board member of the Common Action Forum and the global trustee of the think tank Digital Futures Society. Okay, one last thing for our audience. This is really important. Before we start the conversation, I quickly want to remind you all of the possibility for you to engage in the conversation by asking questions. For everyone who's watching now live, you are welcome to send us your questions by emailing to schoolofresistance at antigent.be 
or by commenting on the live stream on the Facebook pages of Antigent or IPM. We also use via Twitter the hashtag School of Resistance. Okay, so that was an introduction. Thank you all for being here. Sean, um, I would like to start off this conversation by asking you about your story. Um, could you tell us more about why you decided to speak out the truth about the US Don't Drown program in Afghanistan? Uh, yeah. Um, so, I guess this is kind of relevant to something that's happening right now, but um, I mean, and and I would say uh, I come from a little bit of a, be a different background than a lot of people who joined the military. Um, but uh, in, in um, 1997, uh, my family moved to Armenia uh, and uh, we, uh, my, my father was working with the United States Embassy, and uh, we lived there for four years. Um, it was about three years after the end of the um, the war with Azerbaijan, the first one, and uh, and of course the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, so in, in the time that I was there, we uh, we saw quite a bit of suffering. Our school visited the orphanages. We would. Uh, you know, it's perform shows and stuff for them. Um, and then uh, my, my father would take me out into the countryside quite often. And there would be a lot of people who were in really desperate situations. Um, and uh, I, I'd say that that kind of painted over um, my uh, experience in Afghanistan later. Uh, I, you know, I, I would say that when I was in the Air Force, I didn't, wasn't really like wanting to go to Afghanistan. Um, it was just our unit was called up and, you know, I felt obligated to. Um, and uh, once we got there, uh, we set up a, uh, you know, a, a communication site that uh, relayed um a lot of data that the aircraft were using, um, you know, to the Combined Air Operations Center, and then of course to the 24th uh, Intelligence Squadron, uh, or the Distributed Ground System uh, Number Four, uh, in uh, you know, in uh, at Ramstein, um, and uh, and something. Um, that I kind of realized while I was there and uh, something that, you know, kind of, uh, I guess bothers me, uh, now. And, and one reason that I, that I really spoke up is because, you know, the, the drone itself isn't the, uh, it's not the weapon system. That's not the only weapon system. The, the, the real weapon is the network behind the drone um, and everything that makes that drone function. And uh, there's a lot of different people that are making decisions uh, within that, uh, that system. And it's, uh, you know, so there's, there's, there's a lot of potential for error because uh, all those people are, you know, doing, uh, different, um, you know, jobs within, in that program to make that function. Um, so it's, uh, so I saw how the conversation around drones was really oriented towards drones, um, but not really of how these drones operate and, you know, what makes them fly, where the intelligence goes, who makes the decisions in the process and how, you know, all this comes together so that a pilot can, you know, uh, make the decision to uh, do an airstrike. And, uh, you know, I, I thought it was really important for the countries that are involved, the countries that uh, are housing the infrastructure for the U.S. drone program to uh, actually 
you know, have an idea of, of what's happening on their own territory. Uh, cause it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it can potentially, uh, make these countries targets, uh, for retaliation, but also, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, what the international community would consider to be war crimes, uh, that are happening through these, uh, these, uh, drones and these networks. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think, um, I think it would be really helpful if, uh, if people watching this would, uh, visit killchain.org. Um, cause it's, uh, it kind of gives you an idea of how, uh, you know, not only just the network, but also the uh, technology and the, the applications that are used uh, in this technology um, are, uh, you know, can make mistakes uh, on their own. Like there, there's there's a lot of uh, room for error um, with different sensors, uh, with different programs that are being used and how people interface with these programs. Um, and of course, when they're working together, there's, there's a lot of potential for unforeseen errors to occur. Um, and as uh, most people know, like there have been quite a few incidents where civilians have been killed in, uh, drone strikes. Uh, you know, some of those may have been a, uh, you know, cost benefit analysis while, uh, you know, others were genuinely mistakes. Um, but, uh, these, these types of things that, you know, the, the public need to know about so they can hold their politicians accountable, uh, and, uh, they can adequately question the policies that are being put forth to, you know, use these drones because the drones themselves are, are tools, but, you know, it's, it's a very, politically expedient weapon system to use for politicians, you know, trying to, you know, see their own uh, objectives met in these war zones. Um, and uh, I think it's, uh, you know, we, we're, we've been at war for 20 years now. And, um, you know, and I think uh, it's, you know, far past time we start questioning, you know, why, why have we been in these wars? Um, and what is the ultimate objective? Um, you know, Donald Trump said that they're going to pull out by Christmas. Um, there's nothing really, you know, showing that in, in concrete terms that, that that's actually going to happen. Um, and uh, I wouldn't necessarily trust uh, Joe Biden to do that either. So uh, really the only thing that can, um, you know, affect this is, is public pressure. Um, and, you know, that's, that's something that can happen across international boundaries. And I, in fact, I think it should uh, because we're all involved. So that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean, for um, starting the conversation with this um, explanation, um, even about holding accountable um, the politicians we vote for. And Renata, I want to ask you about a very prominent case um, that uh, is happening. And for our audience uh, to know, on January 4th, court will announce its judgment in the extradition trial of Julian Assange, journalist and co-founder of the media organization WikiLeaks, that revealed, among others, several war crimes committed by the US military in Iraq and Afghanistan. Being charged with 17 criminal counts under the US Espionage Act and facing 175 years of jail time, not only Assange, but the whole of press freedom and free speech is at risk. So, Renata, um, could you, as one of the lawyers in the team of Assange, explain to our audience what exactly is happening in this case 
and why in the end it's so fundamental to fight for Julian Assange's freedom. Yes, you know, like uh, the interesting thing is that uh, probably the expectation from the audience uh, will be like that I will go, I will go through all the technicalities of an extradition process. And this is not what a school of resistance uh, should be about. That you can do it later. I will point at the resources. I will point at, at, at all the all the paperwork that has been filed in, in this case. Because at the end of the day, it's not about the dozens of lawyers and the thousands, uh, thousands of hours uh, invested in this case trying to defend what is just. And then what I want uh, the people to understand and what I want the people attending the School of Resistance to bear in mind that this case is not about Julian Assange anymore. This case is more about us than about him. Because what, uh, what's at stake in this case is our right to know, is whether we are authorized to even know that uh, terrible crimes against humanity have been committed. All the things that Sean was, uh, was explaining, that is what is at, at stake. It is if this case sets a precedent, we are the ones, the society as a whole, not only us, but the future generations that are going to face at the most challenging times uh, confronting corporate power and, conf and confronting the most powerful governments in the world just to survive. That's what's at stake in this case. It's, it's, uh, it's a case that basically is saying that a journalist has no right to publish. That, But on the other side, saying that a journalist has no right to publish, it means that you don't have right to know and that you cannot uh, exercise any so, uh, any form of accountability uh, when when we know what what's going on. I mean, like the, the 10 years, the, the last 10 years, um, if we learned any lessons, it is that we cannot uh, take democracy for granted, and we cannot uh, we cannot even trust the resilience of free press. Uh, and in the last ten years, there have been assassinations of journalists in Europe and nearby. It has been it has been a, I mean it has been like a an, a an absolute erosion of rights and a complete change of narrative. So. Uh, the, the the three most more important things I will say, and the, and the most important lessons, and the most important battles that we have in this case is number one, the public is smart, and the public, equipped with the truth, can change the outcomes uh, and can effectively uh, transform societies. Because we have, at least in the last five years, we have been hearing every every day that uh that the people do not know that they spread fake news that are incapable that like, you know like uh, basically um the narrative that uh, wikileaks elevated and that uh, drove movements like the arab spring uh, indignados in spain occupy wall street occupy london's uh, stock exchange and other other very very powerful citizen driven initiatives was the we when the people know the truth one, when the truth is not mediated, is not uh, with makeup on, and when when the facts, when people is equipped with facts, and when injustice is exposed, uh, without uh, all the peer preparation that usually media has, then you activate changes. Second, the people can use the internet to organize, and the 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 uh, global availability of this truth will mobilize thousands. And the third thing that uh, that um, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange said uh, uh, did is we are invincible, invincible in a sense that you cannot shut us down, you cannot censor what we are publishing, and any person all over the world without paying, without uh, without uh, holding a specific passport, has the right to truth, has the right to know, and especially has the right to know and to access that uh, pieces of knowledge that are just held by the elites. So democratization of access to the key information, uh, information to make uh, uh, informed decisions. That, that narrative, we are at the opposite side today. Imagine if WikiLeaks was, I mean, this is still active and this is still resistant, but imagine if it was, if it was not 
crushed uh, in so many attempts if, if it wasn't attacked in, in that way. The culture of today will be a culture that will have us equipped with the best uh, citizen initiatives and, and the most resilient press to combat, combat fake news, to uh, challenge uh, this uh, global emergency that we're living and to effectively confront power and distribute the power of, uh, of, of publishing, uh, uh, removing it away from elites. What we have today is just the opposite. It's just the opposite because we didn't resist and responded enough to the threats and to the effective attacks uh, against WikiLeaks. That's one of my, uh, um, or in my opinion, uh, why is really, really, really important to stop this case here? Because we are like almost at the limit. If we let this case set a precedent, we are in serious trouble. We are in serious trouble because the ability for us to publish, the ability for the public to know, and the ability to hold others accountable will be completely removed from us. Uh, so this case is not about Julian. This case is about us and the future of what we will know and what, what will be hidden from us. If now uh, we are giving corporate power, the power to select what we see, select what we read, and select what should be removed, and, and just five companies in one jurisdiction, and if we are, on the other hand, we are like a, letting a system torture a man in the center of London, in the center of London, in pretrial detention, in really bad conditions, that a man that never hold a gun, that never hurt anybody, a journalist, a father, a friend of many of us, then that that that's the parameter. We don't want, so it, it is more an ex, ex, exam about our values and about us. We do not want to know, it seems. We want our speech to be controlled by Silicon Valley companies or by nanny state. And the, the third thing is that we accept injustices. Even if we claim to care about injustices is very, very far from us, we accept injustices at, in the heart of the West. And so those are my initial reflections on why, why this case is important. Very brief, because I, I know that uh, it's important to know like, the timeline. This is just the pre-trial detention for the extradition for a case that is, it hasn't even started in the US. So the road is really, really, really long. But ideally, I mean, uh, ideally, what we need to do is similar with the, with the drones, mobile, mobilize enough pressure to declare this unacceptable. We will not accept that our rights are removed from us and stop this case here, because if this case arrives in the US with the current composition of the Supreme Court and the current composition of the, of the tech industry, we are in serious trouble. Thank you, Renata. Mm -hmm. Eche, Renata mentioned already the, the threat to journalists in Europe. Um, I want to, for our audience, um, state a quote from the Reporters Without Borders um, about Turkey mm -hmm. before I ask you the question, uh, which states Turkey is the world's biggest jailer of professional journalists spending more than a year in prison before trial is the new norm and long jail sentences are common in some cases as long as life imprisonment with no possibility of a pardon detained journalists and closed media outlets are denied any effective legal recourse can you tell us more or elaborate on this quote and i would really like to know your own story um, as a journalist or writer um, in this country? Uh, well, Turkey is a tragic joke that nobody know, you know, nobody laughs any longer. And this is where the entire world, the proud Western world will end up uh, if they don't follow what Renata and Sean uh, are saying right now. Let me pick where Renata um, left. Um, Renata said when it's happened, when these, uh, you know, violation of uh, freedom of expression happen in other countries, we are so 
you know, sensitive, but when it happens in the heart of best, we are not that, you know, we don't bother to uh, react. Uh, and let me add to that, that uh, people like Renetta or Sean, when they are in Second World War movies, we watch them as heroes and we never understand why the other people do not do what they do. Why not the other people say what they say? And that is why we have to talk about why now is less magical or less, um, you know, less clear than it is in Second World War movies. Uh, Hannah Arendt is so popular nowadays, uh, and also George Orwell, and everybody is talking about a dictatorship. But I think they all, that many people think that dictatorships uh, come in fully, you know, in uniforms and in goose steps. They walk towards the power, you know, capture the White House or Westminster. It doesn't happen like that. It happens like, uh, like in, in the way Renetta explained or Sean explained. When Sean and Renetta become the heroes, they require to be, you know, you, they, uh, they need to act heroically in order to say the truth. When that is the normal condition, that is when the dictatorships are built, actually. And the rest of the, you know, fanfare is, just happens very quickly. Um, we, uh, we tend to understand things when we look at the history, but we, uh, we don't really... Uh, uh, dare to see what is happening in front of us. Renata talked about Julian Assange and Sean is another Julian Assange in that sense. And what, what is most important in their situation, uh, the whistleblower situation, or for you know the, the, all those people who are telling the truth, is that they are uh, their solitude. Uh, and why that solitude is happening is the crucial question in our times. Renata and thousands of, the, of other people are supporting uh, Julian Assange. Uh, Sean is probably surrounded with a lot of people, but these numbers are not enough. In order to mobilize, in order to resist, uh, the words and the bodies have to come together. No resistance is composed of only words and no resistance uh, is formed. No um, effective resistance can only be consist of thousands of people. It has to be many, many more. So what is, the, you know, when we, we, I think we have to, in School of Resistance, maybe this is a good, good question to ask, why so many people are, so sure where to stand when they're watching a second world war movie about nazi era uh, but they why they are so hesitant when it comes to today the question is uh, the the reality is uh, they don't see the propaganda that is shaped around people like julian assange julian assange or sean uh, all this time, I am sure millions of people in the world today, if they hear the world Julian Assange, the first thing they would remember would be the rape cases or, you know, how megalomaniac it is, it, he is or whatever, all the negative stuff. And they don't, we are not uh, maybe saying enough. These are, you know, discrediting propaganda. It is a political tool. It's a classic political tool uh, used by the power, by fascist, fa by fascism itself. For you know, several in several ways, uh, for several times history, it has been used. Um, so that solitude uh, is arising from this propaganda, and when it's happening to us. When it's happening in present time, it is not easy to see through the propaganda. So our job, if we are interested in telling the truth, is making sure that propaganda um, is, uh, is made ineffective or eliminated by the number of voices that are telling the truth, which is not an easy, easy thing. 
Uh, you ask about my personal story, which I think is not important at all in this case. But I know through my own story that when you're telling the truth, um, the most um, uh, troublesome thing is not actually the pressure that you are receiving from the power, but actually it is to feel completely alone. And even by those people who th you consider uh, closest to you are becoming hesitant to support you. And that hesitation is where fascism begins and the resistance uh, fades away. So I think this is what we have to think about because we're living in a world um, where post-truth somehow became, a, the word post-truth somehow became a sexy word even. Because now, you know, as opposed to, you know, beginning of 20th century, now, the post-truth, the alternative facts, whatever you call them, can be produced not only by single power, by the oppressive power, but also by uh, the supporters of the power. So it is a chaos. And as Renata mentioned it briefly, uh, uh, we are using a communication sphere which actually belongs to few people in the world. And we tend, to con we tend to think that we are in an agora where everybody is equal, where everybody is free to speak. No, we are actually Twitter, Facebook, all those social media outlets. We are in someone's private garden and we are speaking as much as we are allowed to speak. So, and on top of it, this garden is unregulated. And in any unregulated space, I'm a lawyer as well, Renata, uh, there is no law. And when there is no law, there is chaos, there is jungle rules where the powerful beats the powerless. So our communication sphere where truth is shaped is a horrible space. And in that horrible space, the powerful is allowed to produce propaganda uh, to produce discrediting propaganda about the truth sayers. So if we see this picture clearly, we can understand where we should be standing and with whom we should be standing with. You don't have to like Julian Assange. He has all the, you know, uh, not only discrediting, but also unpleasant portrayal uh, in the mass media, I mean, like, there, are, there are so many articles about him. You don't have to like him. You don't have to be even friends with him. You don't even have to admire him for what he's done. The problem is, do you want to live in a world where the truth sayer can be executed digitally in the most easy way possible? This is where we have to start resistance. It's not only resistance against the oppressive power, actually. What we have to resist against is our hesitation to stand with those people who would be heroes in a Nazi era movie. But when things are too colorful, uh, when they're not black and white, like in those movies, people get confused and they start changing the subject you know, step uh, taking a step back, just uh, waiting the subject to be over. They they mute themselves, and that is when things go really, really ugly. I'm coming from Turkey, as you said, and I have been trying to tell the other, uh, tell the peoples of other countries that you are going to end up in the same troubles that Turkey is suffering through now. It's not because I'm a Cassandra trying to impress people with my horrible pr uh, predictions. There is a logic to the new fascism of our times. And it's re this logic, this pattern is repeating itself exactly the same way in every country, like it's happening in the United States right now. And I was actually thinking during the election days in the United States, how lucky they are and how they're not aware of their advantage because they still have a 
reasonably free media, they are still allowed to speak the truth. They're not going to be imprisoned. Somebody will not come to their door at five o'clock in the morning and then they will be taken away or they're not going to be threatened with their lives. So it is time for Americans or for other peoples of the uh, other countries, uh, if they have uh, reasonably free media, to use this power to show who the people are supposed to stand by today in order for the world not to end up in a total fascism, just uh, like Renata mentioned in her speech. Thank you, first of all. Um, I was wondering, and Echo was mentioning it already, um, first of all, what is it like to express truth in the so-called post-truth world? And as Echo um, spoke about the solitude of the truth teller, um, I first want to ask Sean, um, so my when I was preparing this talk, I was really wondering, how do you really feel about this? Like, what is it for you and your own personal truth? How, how can one seek for that? And to expose truth um, when it's a world where we don't even know anymore what's true uh, in the internet. And um, I also the question about the solitude that Aisha mentioned. So I don't know if you can follow me, but these are the what I'm a little bit struggling right now with. So uh, there's there's a quote. It's uh, it's it's from ancient Greece uh, from Aeschylus, uh, and uh, it's that in war truth is the first casualty. So this is something that's been persisting for for a long long time the united states has been uh at war for 225 years of its 243 year history um i think right now because there's so many different narratives uh you're you're seeing it's more of a crisis of narratives uh and i mean truth truth is truth truth never goes away uh truth shines through you know, historically. Um, so, you know, while, you know, we're, we're kind of in this like fog of war of the global war on terrorism and, you know, how uh, politics have kind of abandoned this, this, uh, you know, this idea that truth can even be attained or that it's even something to strive for. I mean, in a sense, like truth has always been kind of on the back burner as far as politics goes. Um, but, uh, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely seeing the, the penalization of people who have brought up, you know, certain truths to, uh, to the public that, that challenge the powers that be. Um, I mean, my, myself, uh, I mean, Daniel Hale is being uh, currently being prosecuted. Um, he's facing up to 50 years in prison. Um, and, uh, you know, people like uh, Julian, yeah, uh, Edward Snowden and, uh, and I mean, Brandon Bryant is uh, in a legal pickle at the moment. Um I mean, it's certain like certain narratives, our narratives are being challenged um, and they're being suppressed. Uh, you know, the the, uh, the question is, is like, you know, has this made a chink in the armor? You know, has has our, you know, drops in the bucket actually uh, accumulated into something that, uh, you know, uh, people are starting to realize, you know, more like systemically what these issues are. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine people in the United States, like, 
you know, I think I think over half half of the country now opposes the war in Afghanistan. Um, I mean, they see it as futile. I mean, when I started speaking out, that wasn't really the case. Um, you know, uh, people are actually starting to understand, you know, what encryption is. Uh, you know, you look at the gener Generation Z, I mean, they're uh, the preferred, you know, chatting applications are encrypted now. Uh, I mean, despite the fact that it's, you know, it's WhatsApp and it's under the realm of Facebook. But I mean, the sentiment is there. The understanding of the need of privacy is there. Um, I mean, whether or not like my individual voice is, you know, revered, I don't, I don't really care. All I really care is uh, if, if there's positive movement. Um, and right now there's, there's a lot of chaos, but, you know, at the same time, you know, there's, there's a lot of pressure being put on power, um, you know, that maybe we're not really paying attention to because, you know, we're, we're so nervous about what's happening in power at the moment. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, in, in terms of people being jailed, like, people know that's unjust. Like, people know that, you know, Julian Assange being extradited to the United States is unjust. I mean, it's outrageous. It's, uh, you know, I mean, he's a, he, first off, he's not an American citizen. Uh, he didn't do any of that in the United States. Um, and he's, uh, uh, you know, the things he's being prosecuted for, you know, aren't the things that everybody's really mad about. Like, like they think that he had something to do with Trump being elected. You know, that's, that's really why the left is mad. Um, but, you know, so did a lot of things. <laughs> um, I mean, namely, you know, the United States has a big racism problem, like, I mean, it's pretty obvious, um, but, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not entirely disheartened despite the fact that, you know, like the pressure's on us. And I mean, you know, if I go to jail then I go to jail, but, um, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I'm seeing a lot more people actually, you know, willing to resist than ever before. So, I mean, that's, to me, that's what I look at, you know, and I'm, I'm encouraged by that. I really, because we are already quite at the end of our conversation, I, I still want to ask the audience, of course, to send us some questions if they have some. But um, for me, it's uh, right now the question of hope, Renata. Um, I always, always, always <laughs> the question of hope, but I, I was ready because I saw it coming, you know. I, I have to speak about hope because yeah, other than that, yeah, I wouldn't yeah. be this hard. You know, like, would... uh, to, to this, um, we are learning in this school of resistance and, and, and we are learning every day by doing. And I think that no, no, no year prepares better to train the muscles of resistance than this year, you know, like uh, if something we we learn, if anything we learned about this was to be more resilient, to be more critical, and to be uh, and to be more aware of our uh, of our uh, well being as a key piece to these battles ahead. And the the three things that I want to say is number one, um, saving freedom of speech and saving the right to know, and saving the right to protest, and saving the right to be ourselves, and create new political projects, and change the world for better, number one, is not too difficult. It is not too difficult. You don't need a PhD. You don't need a million dollars to make it possible. That's true. And, and if, 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 if you think that it's difficult, it's because media and groups in power, in power repeat it every day and elevate some very few cases that they want of heroes and put them above us. But this, not, this is not truth, it's not too difficult, it's something that all of us can do every day and it, should not, it shouldn't be heroic 
it should be a daily action, you know, accumulation of actions in mass. Um, uh, one example, very quick example on, on this, after a, after a coup, it only took one year to organize, pes organize peasants in Bolivia to take power back. Good example of very resilient organization at the community level. You don't need a lot of money, you don't need degrees, you need a really, really carefully knitted uh, uh, societal um, space. Second, it's not, we don't need we, we, to outsmart these technologies. We do not need to be very technical or not technical at, at all. We, there are like actually like, uh, uh, oh, we cannot live without Facebook, we cannot live without Twitter, we cannot live without this. Actually, there are plenty of alternatives right now ready for us to occupy, ready to, uh, for us to make our own. But technology is not the answer. It's the answer it goes back again to this point of how do we organize as a community and how we become, become aware and strategic. And the, um, the best technology that we can install in our brains is critical thinking, which is what's missing from the operative systems of many. And which is the, the thing that we, is, it requires, you know, like it's not, it's not as fun as putting a nice filter on your Instagram picture of the perfect breakfast, <laughs> but more satisfying. It's more challenging, you know, like uh, if you make people start thinking I, that process, that that process to think together, to discuss, to think deeper, to exercise that muscle is far more more exciting than any time that we spend uh, doing this in, on the screens. But the key ingredient of it, this is that it has to be fun and it has to be intimate, and it has to be personal, and it has it it, it doesn't have to be like you know like uh, people need to understand that they don't need to become the next Assange or the next Snowden. People need to know that people like you or people like me can do it as well. I mean, if, uh, if uh, it doesn't require spatial superpowers, it is on all of us to activate it and to then it, it, the more we are, the less likely there will be a Snowden or there will be an Assange. And that's very, very important to remember. And it's not too late. That's the other thing to remember. It is not too late at all to change things. Um, we need to be strategic. We need to be creative. We need to be smart. But the most, the, the most missing ingredient of most people that I want together with critical thinking needs to be developed is courage. We uh, One of the most important things I learned at the time that I was helping Julian and working closely with him was that we are too afraid for nothing. We overdimension risk. We always think that we cannot go a little further. And actually we miss the, a big space of action because often we don't want to go alone. So the key and the lesson in here is let's go and occupy, slowly move that space instead of being in resistant, 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 let's push and push, even slowly, you know, but with many behind. So we can create better, better, more democratic spaces. And uh, the task is listed, it has a date, it's 4th of January. Let's be courageous, let's be creative, let's be strategic, and let's uh, try to save Julian. We will be like with full energy after the Christmas break. So. <laughs> Um, I received some questions from the audience and um, I will just state it to the three of you and you can just see who answers first. Uh, Renata talked about creative strategies and um, so we are an art format. Uh, we use art as a means of our activism and there is the question of the audience. Art is of course about exploring alternative narratives. But how can we, we really use art as a means in fighting this fight for truth? I think that H, H, H is <laughs> answer that one. If we have an art and a, a remarkable artist here, it's her. I mean, 
Well, um, I was thinking actually, well, when it, while Renita was speaking, why do we use the word activist? Now and then I'm like, sometimes uh, I use, uh, I see uh, this word uh, stitched to my name when people are talking about me. And I, and I think, am I an activist? I'm just telling the truth. I'm just doing what I am supposed to do. It's, it's not activism, as if it's another category of human being. You know, you are an activist and then you are not anymore living a normal life, one. And second, you are now uh, described as an activist. And I think, you know, this idea can be explored in terms of art as well. Um, I do not think there is such thing as political art uh, or non-political art. Uh, one, everything is political, uh, you know, needless to say. And second, art is doing what it's supposed to do and it's becoming political, political through that, uh, you know, um, uh, stance anyway. Uh, if you are seeing the world and if you are trying to retell the story of the world, which is art, um, then you are supposed to tell the truth and keep telling the truth, easy as that. And you, by the way, you don't even need hope for that because, or well, let me put it this way, because uh, the only thing you have to uh, understand that we are humans, but of course, a certain understanding of human is necessary here, not the one that we are that is imposed upon us, but the real one, the real definition of human um, includes a lot of determination or inherent determination to create beauty. And here we are, we are creating a political beauty now by uh, talking about the truth. Uh, so what, either you do art or anything else, you paint a wall or you go out, do programming, whatever. Uh, if you know, or if you believe uh, that human being is something, is beautiful, it's something beautiful in its essence, and it's supposed to create beauty, there is no other chance than telling the truth. Because truth has its beauty. Everything is everything real has has some kind of beauty in it. So I think Renata was telling that, and this is important when it comes to resistance, because when people think or talk about resistance, they imagine a clash, a concussion, uh, a shake, or a hit, or you know something violent. Whereas resistance is something beautiful because it reminds us the joy of dignity. And that is the most joyful thing on earth. You would know this if you lose your dignity, that joy is sucked out of you. You are not alive anymore. And our, we are, as humans, are prone uh, or you know, pro, we are hardwired towards that joy and towards creating beauty in order to keep the joy of dignity. So whatever you do, art, not art, anything, this is what you believe. If, you, if this is what you believe, uh, you have no other choice than telling the truth. But as Sean said, uh, one becomes uh, kind of mm, like uh, doubtful, let's say, you know, it, it, I know the feeling. Why am I like? Is is it, is this all in vain? Am I doing this for nothing? Does it really change anything? And school of resistance have to know. You don't have to know the outcome of what you did. I have a French friend who is a poet, and he, she has this amazing. Uh, poetry, it's two lines, and I love it, and it, it tells a lot about resistance or what is human. It says, don't believe in the seed that you're throwing, believe in your hand that's throwing the seed. Just throw the seed 
and then don't think about the rest. And this is how I endured my love, life uh, and my love as well for several people. Um, so we have to believe in our hands and we have to believe that these hands are made to create beauty and they are there to resist when our joy of dignity is attacked. So actually we don't even need hope. Thank you, Itche. That really uh, resonated. Um, I have one question that is, I think, uh, an interesting question, um, too, from the audience. And I think this will be our last question, and then we have to end this very beautiful conversation. How can we make sure the right of freedom of speech is a right that can be actually used by minority voices as well? I'm asking this because I feel the right of free speech is often appropriated by big voices in order to silence resistance or criticism. I, I, I will go for this quickly. I think that is, it, is a, a, it goes hand in hand with this critical thinking because uh, people who do not, uh, who do not have a you know, um, I think that we need to equip pe uh, people with diverse, as many narratives as possible uh, and as many points of view as possible. And I, I think that there's, a, we, we have faced, and I might sound controversial, but we have faced, I have, I have lived this very closely uh, with uh, working in the Assange case. We, we really are shrinking our view to only say certain words, only read certain things. We are self-censoring ourselves all the time and pretending and pretending to be defending rights while doing so, which is not is not the case because uh, I think that uh, um, it happens with women, for example. It happens. It happens with uh, with uh, with many many issues have become so. Um, sensitive to even be discuss discussed out loud that I, I feel honestly I feel less free than 10 years ago and than 20 years ago on what I say what I write and the consequences of having my uh, thoughts on the record and so I think that uh, I think that uh, we need to be very 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 careful on the limits that we want on, on limiting a right I think that uh, I think that uh, uh, delegating uh, delegating what can be said or what can be uh, or, or what cannot be said about a minority doesn't do any favor to the minority. Of, of course, hate speech is not speech, and hate speech is should, it, it shouldn't have a, a a place in our societies. But we need to uh, uh, draw the lines very clearly because I, I have I I am afraid that not because uh, an algorithm suppress some words and and a uh, uh, browser to index some ideas those ideas stop existing and and and. What it what it leaves us is with an incomplete picture of what's going on and a false impression that things are okay. So I I rather deal with um, uh, I, I I rather have divergent points that uh, that are defended and I'm exposed to divergent points and I can make up my mind than having just a uh, um, you know, a reduced, uh, a, a narrow vision of, of what's going on. And, and I think that uh, WikiLeaks was very, very, very good at that because instead of just showing us the interpretation of a piece of news, which often in the media is the interpretation of two lines in a document, it offers us the full picture. It offers us, offered us the full docs. And it, from from the same document, maybe a right wing journalist will make a, uh, will say some things. An expert in the topic will say different things, and a left wing journalist will say completely different things. And maybe I will read the three versions, and then I will read myself the full document, and come up uh, with a conclusion. But less and less we are like uh, we we uh, uh, journalists and uh, academics disclose the full data sets the full sources the full documents that uh, they they use to 
come up with uh, to the conclusions that they arrive. And I think that that um, all the conversation has moved to feelings and hurt feelings and not about facts and substance and documents and things back in your claims. And I think that we need to go back to that WikiLeaks culture of full docs on redacted documents and enabling us on the other side to make up our mind and, and arrive to our conclusions. Thank you, Renata. Thank you. Uh, it's been an hour. I thank the audience for asking the questions. I thank you, Eche, Renata, and Sean for being here today. And um, let's. Um, I will try to be in that kind of ambivalence between the fear what can come, but also a hope. And um, I want to thank you all for this beautiful conversation. And I hope you enjoyed it too. And I wish now the audience a very good evening and see you soon. Thank you, Kasia. Thank you, Renata. Thank you, Sean. It was great meeting you.